Morning, Justin. Only person on. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, again. We got people in the office too. So we're gonna oh, zoom in. Oh, awesome. Shows up. But this is Charlie Lane, our our preferred real or our preferred attorney. I'm the realtor. So. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm Justin. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just gonna, we're just gonna do a powwow here for everybody to ask him questions and really test his knowledge. Oh, yeah. We'll let, cool. yeah, we'll let him get started and talk to us a little bit. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, and I don't have a, a strict um, agenda or anything, so I'm open-minded if anybody has questions about anything particular. Um, one thing I'll start with is sort of breaking news for our firm. We finally are live on the app called Earnest. So we're able to do EMD electronically now, which is really, really cool. Um, I did the little training and everything last week with them and it's, we've been doing it in South Carolina and now we're in North Carolina too. And it's super simple. It's, it's very, very convenient for everybody. And obviously digging deeper into that, there's a lot of risk involved taking personal checks around town. So agents don't need to worry about handling money anymore. Um, we're excited about it. So basically it's like Venmo or um, Zelle, something like that. You just request it from the buyer and they sync up their bank account. It goes through automatically to our trust account electronically. Does it have to be a bank account? Not that it matters, but we've had like people versus ask about, credit card or like Cash App or Zelle like that. Um, Obviously Zelle's bank, Cash App, Venmo. Those, I mean, I think those would all be tied to a bank account. Anyways, yeah, right? So, yeah, out. yeah. I think it has to come from a bank account because the Earnest, the app uses Plaid, if you're familiar with that. It's like a service that syncs mm -hmm. bank accounts. Okay. So if you um, if you got on something like Nerd Wallet or one of those services that lets you do all your finances in one place, they use Plaid to sync all your accounts. So it's the same thing. You can either go into Plaid and it'll find your bank and sync you up or um, just type in routing and checking manually is what the buyer will do. Um, so there's two options on that. The You, the agents can do it. You can do it from the app yourself. So you can put in the buyer information um, or we can do it for you, which is probably easier. So is it an app as well, you said? Yeah, it's... Um, there's an app and there's a website. And so what I'm screen sharing is the website platform, but there's a app version too that we use the most. Um, so what you're looking at is the, um, it's just the platform that we see and you can put in a request for a property, put in the property address. So whenever we get a contract in, we'd ask for the buyer's email address and phone number. And mm -hmm. then, um, we send in the amount, we put in the earn the escrow holder name, which is our firm, and then um, they get an email and a text message that says, please fill out this form and send your EMD. Okay. And, and the other option is the agents can do it too. So you could get under contract, you could send the request yourself from the app to the buyer, and then it would come straight to our account too. So a uh, couple different ways to do that. But we tried it in South Carolina for our firm and, um, and it's gone very well. So now we're, I've been pushing for North Carolina for a while and um, sounds like our main operation in Georgia is gonna pick it up too pretty soon. So we are excited about that. Um, so that's, we can keep screen sharing or whatever, but- I'm gonna stop a, it. So the, yeah. I mean, that's all we need on this yeah. one. That way they can see your awesome face. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, we want that. Um, so our plan is to open form with Charlie today. So if anybody has questions they want to ask, I mean, go ahead and get, ask it. Anybody? How many locations do you have real quick? Yeah, so locally, I'm in Charlotte. We're in South Park, um, right behind the mall. We also have an office in Rock Hill and one in Greenville also. Um, we are technically in Columbia, but not for long. Not for long. Um, but those are our main operations locally. We're not opposed to 
adding future offices and locations as we grow and and it makes sense but that's where we are right now um firm wide picture we have 27 offices i think we are in six states north south carolina tennessee georgia florida and alabama so our firm is headquartered in georgia in lawrenceville georgia um opened there about 15 16 years ago now and uh, has grown organically over the years and especially over the last five years been the benefactor of a very hot real estate market and um, most of our firm's model is growing geographically with bigger clients like builders so um, a builder is what brought us up to charlotte in the first place in 2017 they opened shop when a builder from atlanta uh, broke ground up here and then they hired all of us on locally um, we've done the same thing in Nashville now, in Rock Hill. Um, Florida was a joint venture with a title company, I believe. And then um, same thing in, in other states too, but mostly your, your large national builders, that's how they um, open these new markets. And then we grow organically when we're on the ground. So that's big picture and there's probably 40 50 of us attorneys total now um up here in charlotte we just have five of us on staff three attorneys two paralegals and job postings out for a new pre-closer um we had somebody who left us who was not maybe carrying their weight let's say and um had some other reasons they needed to leave so we're excited about an opportunity to maybe um help our ladies out that are getting busier. But um, six of us will be six of us total in the next couple of weeks in Charlotte. And in Rock Hill, we've got two attorneys and one, two, three, three paralegals now. Um, so we're a small office locally, but big firm down south. Tell them what's your class name again? We are McMichael and Gray. Yep. And people always ask me which one I am. <laughs> Neither one yet, but. <laughs> yet. You had a question, Diana. So Charlie and I just worked on something this week, which I thought was uh, a good point to bring up to everybody. Um, I had a South. No. So. Yeah, South Carolina contract. Sorry. <laughs> and is that the only contract? Huh? Talk louder so they can hear you. Um, I had a South Carolina yeah, contract. Hi, there we go. We're just gonna pass you around, Justin. That's good. Um, oh, hi, Amina. Um, so I had a South Carolina contract this week that right before closing, um, it was a VA deal, but we had done a, an appraisal waiver on it. So the agent, the buyer's agent, had not submitted a VA addendum with the offer because, hey, you know, we're already doing an appraisal waiver. Well, of course it comes back that the lender being VA lender is going to require it. So this agent tried to have us sign it at the last minute. And the question I had was, well, if I sign this now or my client signs it now, is it going to actually override the existing appraisal waiver? Because now we're not doing it at the same time, we're doing it later on down the road. So what happens when that happens? Um, and so the moral of the story, and I'll let Charlie kind of get into it a little bit more was, um, no, <laughs> you kind of have to watch your back on that, um, which thankfully, in my particular case, we were able to, the, sell, the buyer's agent would not tell me what the house appraised for. Because I'm like, if the house met appraisal, it doesn't matter, right? But she refused to. Apparently, her firm says that her buyer paid $600 for it, quote unquote, and that it's pretty much none of our damn business because they own the report. And I'm like, well, I mean, technically yeah, true. technically, technically true. But if we're all in this together and our goal is to get it to the end of the game and you have nothing, I don't need an amount. I need to know if it meant value. Right. Um, so it was definitely, uh, it was one of those things. So I just went behind her and went to the lender and the lender put it in writing. It was like, well, you met value. You're fine. And I was like, okay, cool. And then we signed it. We were done. But if we hadn't met value and we had signed the VA addendum, they technically, for Charlie, could have pulled out at the last minute and gotten all of their money back because they could have fought it and said, well, that now overrides it because the wording in the VA addendum does say it supersedes anything else. Mm -hmm. So be very careful with situations like that. I was dealing with an agent, you know, one of those agents that's um, older and thinks they know everything. 
um, and literally sent me this VA addendum and said, all it does is say that, you know, they're using a VA loan. And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> See, that's not what it says. <laughs> um, I teach classes on this. Do you want to come? Like it was one of those, but this was a, it was a very interesting legal situation. Um, so anyways, I'm going to give that back to Charlie. Maybe you can talk about it. Um, Corley says has a question. I have a question for you, though, Diana. Okay, so are you saying they submitted the offer and it did not accompany the VA addendum? Correct. At closing, they were demanding a signature of it. The yeah. underwriter. The underwriter. Right. 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 Okay. Right. So basically, they would have lost financing if you hadn't signed. Correct. Right. Yes. Okay. So it was mm -hmm. you were stuck in the pickle. The guy mm -hmm. wanted to get in there, but right. we had to, my job is to protect our client. Right. And of course, the attorney that we're using is representing primarily the buyer because the buyer chooses it and they're not going to get in the middle of something between the two of us. So thankfully, I had Charlie to check with him. But wasn't the buyer's agent have been at fault with it? Oh, she totally yeah. was 100%. And okay. she was trying to slide it through the last minute. But yeah, because underwriting wasn't going to approve their yeah, loan at right. that point without right. that addendum. Right. So it, it is, and we, we had the whole take on it was what was their MO here in waiting so long? Is it yes, the underwriting just not caught it and the agent messed up? Or is it that they're trying to get out of this and they pay significantly over asking price? Mm -hmm. So it was like, are they looking to back out at the last minute and utilizing that as a way to do it? Okay. And we kind of had to enable how we were going to handle that. Mm -hmm. So it was a little confusing. Yeah, that was an interesting. Well, this happened Friday and we closed yesterday. So we had a couple of days to work it out, but it was definitely interesting. Um, yeah, and I think the main takeaway is. If you do accept a VA offer, you have to pretty much just expect to sign it, whether it's an hour before closing and oops, we forgot, and it's in good faith and everything, or whatever. I mean, if you're expecting the buyer to close with a VA loan, they're going to have to sign that addendum. Um, I talked to a lender about this yesterday who's a VA specialist, and uh, she got kind of confused. She thought it was about North Carolina at first, but what she said in, in most cases that they see is that there's not necessarily a separate addendum that accompanies the South Carolina contract for VA that they roll it into that paragraph, yeah, paragraph yeah. where they, where in your case, they checked no appraisal contingency, which to me is a, a flaw in that contract that it's, it's pretty confusing in a lot of different ways, but especially for a lot of us who do a lot in North Carolina and then use that contract, it's very different in a lot of ways. But the, the confusing part and what I got out, what I finally got through to this lender I was talking to was, she was like, oh, well, if they're switching to VA, then, then that's something the seller would have to approve. And I'm like, no, I know, they, but they checked VA in the contract. They said it's a VA loan, they disclosed that. But then in the appraisal uh, or the financing contingency, for the appraisal contingency part, they said no contingency for appraisal. And so you see that and it looks like we're not worried about the appraisal, but then you get to the closing table and the lender still cares about that VA clause. So um, this lender I was talking to said they usually send over a separate clause themselves mm -hmm. to make people sign, which makes sense, but it seems like that contract should have a separate VA addendum, but. Anyways, it doesn't, can't control that, but um, that was the confusing wrinkle was it says VA loan and they disclosed that. And then later on it said, we're not, we're waiving the appraisal um, contingency. So definitely confusing. And, and um, once I told her that added wrinkle that they actually disclosed VA and then tried to waive the appraisal, she was like freaked out about that, but. Mm -hmm. I'd have been too. She said she was going to send me some kind of case that came out where um, I think the listing agent actually went under scrutiny for a similar situation that they either refused to sign the VA clause or something like that, and it didn't end up well. But she said she was going to send that this morning. But um, we, I think that we would have been fine. Like, so Andrews had a, had a situation similar to this before, and they just had a separate thing wrapped up. By an attorney that says, hey, we're signing this late, but it still doesn't override what we previously done. Yeah. And so, I mean, that was kind of like, okay, well, if it will accompany this, then I think that we would have been fine. Mm -hmm. We lucked out because I have no idea how that house met the praise value. <laughs> 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 um, but, you know, it was definitely, um, well, and, we lucked out. I mean, part of the problem with that South Carolina contract is, and this is sort of what we started dabbling into on the email chain, was kind of two different legal concepts where the appraisal 
contingency, going back to law school 101, a contingency literally means if this doesn't hit the appraisal, we don't have a contract. Not I can get out, but there's not a contract to begin with. So if you check off appraisal contingency, financing contingency, there's no issue about getting earnest money back or or terminating. It's we don't have a contract because this contract was never formed because the appraisal meeting the appraised value was a prerequisite for us having a contract in the first place. The VA clause doesn't say that. It says even though there's a contract, even though the buyer has sent in earnest money, even though anything else has happened, if this doesn't hit the appraised value, the buyer is legally allowed to terminate without repercussions, including getting their earnest money back. They don't have to, there's still a contract. They still are allowed to move forward on that contract on those terms. But if it does not hit the appraisal, the buyer can back out of the contract. And so there's, those are two different things, fundamentally different actually. And, and so when this lender was pointing out to me that that appraisal paragraph is what's being used in place of a VA clause kind of it's not something I'd really processed before that that was a substitute for that but is that just because the VA addendum is coming through on the federal level so it applies to every state versus some right state versus it does state. yeah and so the language is uniform and I mean honestly I thought there was a separate South Carolina addendum to that contract that was VA language but um, apparently not apparently it's just that paragraph so um but that right that is the basis of the va clause and it's coming uniform but um but that's sort of a different thing to say that we don't have a contract at all versus we do have a contract but i'm allowed to back out of it if a certain thing happens so i will forward you that case whatever she was talking about whenever it comes along i'm curious to read that too but um i thought the uh I want to look at the attachment section on this contract and see. It's good that you caught that though, because they were actually trying to back out. You guys, you just had your clients. Oh yeah. Yeah, they'd be handing it back out of you. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'm assuming that might have been similar to what happened in that case, because from what she told me, the listing agent might have gotten in trouble on that. So. Um, yeah, because the so the South Carolina contract doesn't actually have the whole. Oh, these are the, you know how North Carolina has a check box. Right. We're attaching an addendum attached. Addendums. Yep. South Carolina just has a plain line. You know, in South Carolina, you can write on their contracts. And so it literally, like, I think it was the city one. It's, I'll send this to you, I'll send you one. Um, but it's literally just a, like, three lines where you can write in the name of, or form number of any contract that you have, any addendum you want to attach to it. So it's almost like you don't have that checkbox section. They were used yeah. to in North Carolina to talk about the VA addendum. I think that there is one in South Carolina forms for VA, but yeah. I don't think it's a trigger point for them because they automatically right. assume it's a contract. They don't have right. It sounds like what happened in that yeah. case, but um, that all goes back to knowing how to draft your contracts too. And it sounds like the buyer's agent probably did not or just messed up on that one little piece. But um, luckily it had a good conclusion in your case. and. It did not miss appraisal and it did get closed, but you can see where that could create a big problem. And that's where you start stepping into liability if you're not filling out contracts right or anything. So, and guys, like, keep in mind again with the debt and appraisals, yes, don't go telling people what your appraisals came in at. But if it's for the common goal and we know the net value, it is okay to say we're good with net value and walk away, right? So I always, that, I always do that, that when I'm the buyer agent. I yeah. always tell the seller, "Hey, good news, we met value," and just leave it at that because they want to know that too. Even if there's an appraisal waiver, they still want to know, "Hey, how'd the appraisal go?" Right. So all you have to do is tell them, "Hey, we met value." You don't have to tell them the value of it. You don't have to tell them it came in fifteen thousand over, and your buyers are getting mm -hmm. instant equity. You don't have to give them that, but at least give them the news well, that it met value. You want to, you want to, you want to speak on it. Unless you have an appraisal waiver. Yeah. yeah. Like if you, even if you have an appraisal waiver calling and saying, Hey, look, we got the appraisal back. We, it, of course, didn't meet what we thought it was going to, but we're still good. Or we, you know, it didn't meet what we offered, but it's, we're still good to the appraisal. Order. Let them breathe and sleep at night, please. Even yeah. That, so like, they know everything's good to go. Even if they've got 10 grand on the line in earnest money, they can still back out. And those poor sellers are still stuck having to list the house. Mm -hmm. so you don't assume that just because your people put up money that they think they're going to go through with everything. 
Right. Yeah. Like, look at it. If somebody would walk away with ten grand, you'd be fine with that. Right. You know, I'll leave ten grand on the table if I'm a hundred thousand dollars under. You know what I mean? So give people the common courtesy of it's not us against them. You do have a common goal to get there, and you can yeah. divulge a little bit and of I, information about yeah. their minds. I think that's a good general takeaway too. Is I mean, you got to get to the closing table with these people, and and even if yeah, I get some people people get fired up, and people ask me a lot of times like legally how far can i go with these people and how can i screw these people over i'm like let's take a step back and talk about how well this is going to go for you even if you try to do that and taking somebody to court or it's not fun it's expensive it takes forever taking somebody to court is not a good outcome to anything and um, even though there is a legal boundary to what you're allowed to do that doesn't necessarily mean you need to go there yeah. You signed a contract on both sides and it was a, a mutual thing. It's it, when we talk about conflict of interest on our side, there's a reason that we are allowed to represent a buyer and a seller in one closing because you've come to us with this contract and said, we all agree what we all want to do. Mm -hmm. I'd love to pay you money. You'd love to get my money and we're going to trade this house in the process for these terms on this, on this date. And everyone agrees. And our job as the attorney is to spit that into a machine and spit it out into a closing based on those numbers and and everyone's on the same page so as soon as you start deviating from that and we're not on the same page anymore or i'm trying to screw you over while we're trying to get the same thing done that's where personalities go by the wayside everything goes toxic and it's not ever going to end well for anybody um i Maybe I'm jaded. I have personal experience with that. But. I would say I had a really, I had a really bad experience on my very first transaction where we had already made an offer way under the asking price, then an appraised way under that price with a VA loan, oh, and, and, and I mean all of my transactions have been like oh, real estate. <laughs> Welcome to real estate. Yeah, um, and then the buyer's agent was totally offended because of course we had to go back to the sellers and say, hey, my comps. I don't know where I got them from. <laughs> yeah, oops. They, they <laughs> Way <exist>. off. <laughs> you know, and I'm trying yeah. to act like I'm experienced and I'm going, I'm like, you're right, they don't exist. Because you know, <laughs> I, I said, you're not right. Well, that might have been a seller that said, I want $500,000 for this house. It was. And the comps say two. And, right. And then the agent stuck there going, you told me 500 so <laughs> but really, they, you got to have that conversation and yeah, say, here's better. the comps, here's why we're not doing that. Our conversation on that one was, what the hell neighborhood is he in? Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, he kept saying, it's on a golf course, it's on a golf course, okay, but where which, on a golf which course? Which golf course and where? Yeah. 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 There's a big difference between peddlers sitting down here in the row and fireworks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What golf course, yeah. Well, my wife and I bought our house a few, three years ago and um, walked away from closing with keys and threats of lawsuits and oh, wow. threats on my, my bar license and... Uh, we, we bought a house in Noda, it's about 100 years old. We got our inspection done the first day and um, had a nice 60, 70 page inspection report of all the old things in this old house in Noda. And one of which was, we're not sure, but I think we saw some knob and tube wiring in the attic and you should get that checked out. And we didn't know if it was live, if it was part of the circuit still being used or if it was dead or whatever. So we asked to bring an electrician out and take a look at it immediately they were like what the hell are you thinking what are you doing like why are you bringing an electrician out there's nothing wrong with this house very very abandoned just aggressive and i showed up for the electrician thing and the seller was still there and she's trying to get her daughter ready for dance practice or something and she was like sorry a real family lives here we're like okay, okay. What whatever the yeah. and then like every night for we closed in exactly 21 days i did the title myself we were ready to go we are approved everything smooth closing and for those 21 days the listing agent harassed my agent all day every day at night texting him screaming at him i don't know why i honestly like, I, have no, I, I honestly yeah, have no sure. idea why but she like went way overboard she got her clients wound up they went crazy um they ended up using a different attorney, which was a good idea in, in hindsight, but because they didn't want like any kind of conflict of interest with me. But um, we got to closing day, and my wife comes over to my office and signs our loan documents and everything. 
And she's like, can I have the keys so I can go start moving stuff in? It's like, well, no, I'm going to be a good little attorney boy. I'm going to hold the keys here and then we're going to record. But if you want to go head that way, you're welcome to do that. And I handed the keys to our receptionist and said, don't give, don't give those to me until we record. And so we record, I grab the keys and I head back over too. In the meantime, my wife had gone to like Walgreens, gotten some bottles of water for moving day. And she's sitting on our front porch in the new swing. Somewhere in there, the seller drove by the house again, saw her sitting on the porch, called her agent screaming, said, they're trespassing, they're trespassing. Why are they trespassing in my house? So weird. Yeah. And uh, yeah. funny for her, we had actual receipts on it. We had a receipt from Walgreens of my wife checking out with her water bottle dated or time stamped after a recording time stamp on the deed. So she objectively never was sitting on the front porch a minute before we recorded the deed, but we recorded everything right away within like an hour of closing. We emailed and called their agent. Her voicemail was full. She didn't see her email. So she didn't even know that we were on record. And then which her people- Which she didn't were, tell the seller. Which means she didn't tell them. No idea. They thought we weren't recorded yet. We moved in early or something. They threatened my bar license. They said I did something wrong. They threatened my agent's license with a, a commission complaint. Um, and then after that, she started stalking my wife on Instagram for about two years. So. Oh, wow. Were they like, did she want to sell or something? Yeah, yeah. We didn't like steal it from right? them. I don't know. <laughs> we, didn't I mean, steal it from we, we had a contract. We paid them a lot of money for that house. So um, I don't know. But she didn't. Hey, the, the listing agent? Ask for her off the record later on. <laughs> Not while we're recording. <laughs> nope. Not off the record either. That's okay. If you, were cra- if you were crafty enough, you could probably figure it out. Oh, but we can. You know, you know what I'm I'm already on it. Yeah. There are ways <laughs> to figure it out. One, one thing to think about that as well any, any time the buyer and seller meet, it adds. I was afraid to use that concept. Yeah. 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 It's, never, it's never good. And, either you did nothing wrong and it was by that. accident, was but yeah. you guys see each other always in the same yeah. number. And she, yeah, she yeah, was, she was, yeah. 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 she was just late getting out of the house by a couple of minutes and we bumped in. I said, Hey, it's nice to meet you. I'm really excited. And like, yeah. this was like a few days after we got on the contract. So it sounds like you, that the listing agent was not very good at her job and was not communicating. So that was my takeaway was she was a little bit high strung and I think she got her people fired up. And, and that's exactly what happens because the the agent sets the tone for absolutely. their clients a hundred percent of the time. And the oh, agent, so if you get around, yeah, she just, she just put the fire. She just yeah, she's not good at putting out yeah. fires. She's not so fire fire. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think these people were not ready to move, but they had sized out the house, and it was kids were getting into school age. They got to like start thinking about all that. So I think there was obviously it's their house. There's emotion behind it. And, mm-hmm. Um, but that's a very underappreciated part of all of your jobs, in my opinion, is the personality management. You can't always control who you're working with and, and how their temperament is, but it's not just about showing houses and getting a deal done and getting a commission check. You've got a lot of personality and a lot of things to manage in between there. And, and that was an example of it, but I can see it at the closing table when people show up, I can tell the the buyers and sellers who have been well coached and informed and managed throughout the process. And then the yeah, ones they actually who hug not. each other and be like, congratulations, yay. Right. The oh, seller to the buyer. I left a little instruction house. manual in the yeah. drawer in the cabinet or whatever. And yeah. Yeah. Or when the agent says, we can't be together, can you do separate ones? Yeah. You know, that's not working out really well. I had an agent show up one time and she stepped into a separate conference room with me and said, I think it's best that I not be here for the rest of closing, but would you be able to give this gift back to my buyers? Oh, okay. that one went so. It's like, is yes. there anything I need to know? She's like, well, they have basically attempted to blackmail me or extort me. Okay, that's that's yeah, she still got me here. Yeah. But honestly, I felt so bad. She's like, just give them right? Yeah, Brad. <laughs> 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 but we see it just we see it all a whole range of people um, 
but that's what I tell people to do. We do new, so we do builder closings for um, Century Communities. I think some of your team has been through on some of those closings, but um, you know, there'll be a neighborhood of 200 houses and they all look almost identical and all the closings are the same on paper, but then they're all completely different because it's different people involved and um, the human aspect of it will never go away. It will always be something that we all have to manage in terms of what we do every day. Are you guys the closing agent for Pompey Hills? Mm -hmm. Oh, I've got a closing agent. In our Rock Hill office. Yep. I have a question for you too. I had a closing where the CD was available upon me arriving. Uh, <laughs> my first closing as well. Um, so I, I had never physically seen a closing disclosure statement. I had not had time to explain it. How often does that happen where the for it just there within minutes of closing? Is that is that normal? Um and this is gonna be a yeah, there's a mix. Sometimes it's just the lender. We don't ever actually balance until an hour before closing. We always try to get it out to agents beforehand. There's, I'm not going to say we have 100% hit rate on it's in your hands 24 hours before, but whenever possible, we try to get it out for everybody to look at. So you don't show up at closing. and It's the first time you're seeing it. But um, I've used them twice and I've had it the day before both times. So they're hundred percent success rate. In my there we go. We are hundred <laughs> percent. Two for two. There we go. <laughs> yeah, because I dealt with Costner Law in my last closing. <clears throat> That's all I'll say. <clears throat> they don't hold keys. They don't do a they lot of things. No, I said, I'm, I want to leave the keys for the seller. They said, we're sorry, we do not, so we do not hold keys. Why here's, is that? Here's an idea on the key thing. I've started buying those cheap $30 lockbox things that have the code and leaving it there. The yeah. key in there, telling the buyer agent, when we close and recorded, the code is one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. That's theirs. The directions are in the drawer. They can change it and keep it for a high to key later. Yeah. It's 30 bucks. Yeah, I mean, not really. the and then, yeah. yep. Mm -hmm. And you leave them all in the drawer with the instructions on how to change that. that and that's code so quick. On there. That's it is. Recorded, and you here's the code. Yep. You're in. You don't have to worry yeah. about going back, meeting an agent, yeah. because a lot of attorneys aren't holding keys anymore yeah. because of the responsibility on that. We will do it. We'll hold keys. Okay. Um, there is a liability, just the passing back and forth, right? You give me the keys and you're the listing agent. And then do I give that to the buyers after we record? Do I give it to their agent to hold until they record? Was I not supposed to do that? Is it, do we have to get that in writing from you and make you sign something? We're not gonna do that, but there's that extra little bit of, call it liability if you want. I mean, um, and then obviously if a deal actually blew up or something went wrong and we had given keys somewhere, then that's a problem, but. That doesn't happen too too often at that stage, but it can happen. Oh, it can what? happen. It can. <laughs> what are you no, over no, there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh -oh. share. No, uh -huh. what the hell? No, it's that kind. Of, okay. <laughs> oh, you found out that. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's what what that <laughs> 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 Anybody yeah. else have questions? Nobody. That's really good Are you? <laughs> anyway, I questions. Said, back to questions. Anybody? We purchased two two houses. Are you? No. Uh, one of our closings was very, very smooth. Very nice. That's other the way it one, should be. The other one, we learned some things from. It's funny that you're an attorney and you still learn some things on your own transaction. So it, I learned a lot. <laughs> we had this conversation a lot, right? That everything yeah. is totally different. And that's like just to with you yesterday. Thing, that even in our own personal transactions, right. you know, it's <clears throat> and things change. I mean, I should have sort of me buying my first one now. I did the low letter. Oh, I, I was gonna say we did two letter, of those. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now we're like, you don't do that. You know, right. things change. I've submitted <laughs> two offers for houses in my life, and we were successful on both. Good. And including using the love letter. Mm -hmm. And right after that is like when the tide came yep. on that and mm -hmm. um, so it was something about that value in fair housing or something like that. yeah you have to be careful what's like, said in that love letter yeah. because it's against fair housing and if you're a realtor which i require all of you to be you have to be very very careful because as soon as you start getting into not i'm offering you five hundred thousand dollars it's i have a baby and we're a family and mm -hmm. we're both Our attorneys and yeah we're, yeah we go to church and stuff like that then 
all of a sudden. Well, you just touched yeah, three fair housing. The <laughs> one's right, right there. What's that thing? Yeah, you need a period. Yeah. We have certain people that are, um, we hear so much about negative fair housing prices, right? We, we hear so much about racism and stuff like that, especially what we don't see is when you're sitting in an open house and someone's like taking a photo out and someone walks in and literally goes, oh my God, they look just like us. And in their mind, they're connecting in a positive way with somebody. But, yeah. but what we're saying is, holy shit, here we go. You know? And it's to the point now on the internet, I talk about it, we're taking out last names on mm -hmm. things. Because if I'm in an area that has, you know, that's prevalent and that's what we're seeing, if I don't want people making a judgment on that offer based off that because that puts me at risk. Right. So, you know, well, so many things have changed. As soon as you have eight love letters and your sellers reading all these letters and one says, oh, me, Michael and my husband or or something like that. And and you just choose a better offer completely because the numbers are better. And then someone else comes back later and says, well, why did you choose their offer? And not ours was it because of this or that or whatever. All of a sudden that seller and you are in the crosshairs of a lot of different reasons, a lot of potential. You so then you have to start covering your own tracks and saying these are our criteria. This is how we chose our offer, and we didn't just pick it based on something demographic reason. So if you don't know any of that stuff and you're just going off numbers and closing dates and the attorney they're choosing and stuff like that, then there's less liability for other factors that can even come into play at all. Don't do it. Just don't do it. Keep yourself out of real estate jail and don't do it. And I always go back to your client. There's a paragraph in our listing agreement. If you're selling to somebody that literally says we have to buy by their house. So you're going over it with your clients. Some things I say, I don't care if you worship the purple pink spaghetti, purple and blue your spaghetti monster, whatever it is. Don't ask me to make sure that someone else goes through this. You know, what color I'm carried about is green, that's the color of mine, right? And they all laugh and they're like, yeah. I'm like, okay. And then when later on we have the conversation about those love letters, they're like, oh, maybe we should. No, no, no. Remember, I asked you not to risk my license and we're only worried about the color green. And anything that has anything to do with anything else is not applicable. This is that. Moment. But that's such a good way to exactly. stick it in their brain. Like, oh, money and green. It's it's kind of like us. Like, you don't pay, you don't stay. Like, that's right. that's not a full legal answer or description of anything, but it's what people remember and they mm -hmm. take away. Um, that's a really good, good way to get that to stick. But going back to them, so don't ask me to risk my license. So you can get emotional right now. This is business. Mm -hmm. It is okay to say that. Well, and so much of that is 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 how you message it too. And if you communicate things like that up front and consistently, the right people will respect you for taking that approach. Right. And they'll say this person has laws and rules they have to abide by. They understand them very well. And hopefully they say, I respect that they care about those kinds of things. And now I do too, because I trust them and don't want to put them in trouble. But all that goes back to like, even like your agency conversation up front, how you say, have you talked to other agents? Are you working with other agents? Have they explained to you about this agreement and what I need you to sign, what I need to explain to you? And I was like, no, I didn't know anything. No, I didn't know anything like that. Like, that's interesting that you've, you're the first one who's told me about this whole agency description. And um, all of a sudden right there is what could just be a boring, dry conversation. It's it's a value you're adding, it's expertise you're showing. And same thing with fair housing laws. We have to do this the right way. And do you want to walk away from closing and you've done things right and legally and well, or do you want to put yourself at risk for something else? So it says yourself apart as the expert and start doing it there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, I have one more question. So what are not quick fixes at the closing table? Like, let's say, <laughs> it I'm depends. Saying, it, I know there are quick things, and I know there are things that's like, hey, we're not closing today. What, what's that thing that I have to know that if it happened, I'm not closing today? Well, there's the, the whole bucket of financing issues. There's the, the buyer we had one time who thought their lender wouldn't care, wouldn't figure out that they'd gotten fired a week earlier. <laughs> and they do their final credit check down. Like, we called your employer, and they said, you don't work there anymore. What, what's going on with that? Oh yeah, I got terminated last week. Well, that's not going to get fixed right away okay. unless they <laughs> unless they rework their loan and they can still be approved based on one salary or the other. That could be a <laughs> a not quick fix. Um, anything to do with the title, a judgment that pops up, or something like that. 
death. Didn't we talk about that a while back? Twice. I had a headache so, twice. Yeah, you and I talked about that. Seller yeah. signed some papers, dies over the weekend. And then Between the Monday. seller and the buyer signing. Seller signed away. Seller signed, yeah. signed a deed and closing disclosure and everything. And then so we, we learned some lessons there and what needs to be done. So if that happens, if a seller dies in the middle of it, come to me. I can help you. I know what to do. That, not what was that? It's happened twice to me. So the seller being alive is not a prerequisite to the sale. Yeah, it's still under contract. Right. Just remember that. It's still under contract until the contract expires. And then nobody's there to sign it on behalf of the seller to extend it. So do they have to go back and open an estate for somebody to sign the rest? Yeah, or? that's exactly what we did. Yeah. Yep. And it just closed a couple weeks ago, so all good. That's not good. to the original buyer. So but say, was it, I mean, this is off. Was it an expected death? Is this like a car wreck? Okay. Boom, we're out. Okay. Then all of them Financial issues is one, I guess. Okay. A lot of it is financing issues, though. Like that, that if the lender needs to know about it, that's what holds it up because it has to go back through underwriting. So if the lender has to know, then you, they, you, you're going to end up delaying it a few days. They go buy a car three days before closing or something. The one I see the most is like most buyers can get educated on that point now if they know they're not going to buy a car. But they go get furniture. It's the furniture. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. the store yeah. card. Yeah. And they know in their minds, I'm not opening new credit. I'm not I'm not borrowing money. But then they go ring up their Pottery Barn furniture and ah, 2% store rewards back on $4,000. I, I better take that. That's a great deal. And oops, I just ran my credit. Didn't think about yeah. it. Yeah. Those are the <laughs> ones. That was, usually, <laughs> yeah, nice that, house. usually that's a quick enough fix. They got to go back to underwriting, get basically reapproved with that new debt on there. So if, if someone was borrowing up to the very, very tippy top dollar of their debt to income borrowing power, and they put a $30 a month obligation on their new store card, then maybe that tips them that they could work around that. But if it's a $500 car loan and they were pretty close to their borrowing power. That might actually be a problem, but um, it could happen though. So some people do go at the high end of their their budget, or they find out later on that they have higher HOAs or something. Yeah, exactly. right. that could do it too. Or the interest rate unlocks and then goes up, or, or anything. Um, those are common things we see, I guess. I think what else has happened recently that. Um, when we were buying a house, we had actually the appraisal for the safety system on the report on our house, and the lender wouldn't close until the safety system was resolved, but the appraiser failed to recommend the fix. So we had to chase down the appraiser mm -hmm. to get a reinspected and to get the recommendation, and then the fix that was done wasn't appropriate or wasn't what the lender wanted. And they Forced us to push closing once and then threatened to push it again. Um, and it was just more because my lender wanted to be sticker when it was looking at a high risk loan. And the appraiser underappraised the house by like $118,000. It, it, it was a fiasco that I had to fight with my lender over um, uh, not pushing the closing yet again. Thankfully, the seller allowed us to. Move our stuff into the garage before we officially sent here to the plan. Like, my, we were moving from Seattle. So our stuff was in the semi going to the house already. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm, we're not doing this. And all it was is it would have a huge concrete patio on the back side, and there's no railings, and there was no steps. And it was like, I think, 18 or 22 inches high. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a mirror that, like, he didn't recommend what kind of steps, he didn't recommend whether it should have a railing or not, nothing. And that's frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask these guys if they have any more questions so we can get on. What can I do? Because I don't foresee it as a safety risk, and my loan to value um, ratio is so low for you that you guys have no issues. Like, there's from your side, there's no concerns, there's no risk on the loan at all. Yet, you're preventing me from closing on the house. Like, give me something to sign so we can actually build them. They allow me to sign the waiver. 
Cool. Good. All right. A anybody on Zoom, do you have any more questions before we let you go? No, nope, nope, that was good. It was good to listen and uh, hear everyone else's questions. And thank you again, uh, Charlie. I appreciate your time today. Yeah, of course. All right, guys, we're going to let you go. We'll see you again next week, hopefully. Thank you. Bye. Bye.